All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time once again. I always want to tease our new show, Future Proof, the world's first made for TV webinar series. You may see some of this content uh, in the fall on your TV station. Check for local listings, folks. So let's dive right in, folks. Building your dream app with inline analytics, the briefing room with Looker. Of course, Looker is part of Google these days. Pretty clever move on their part. Yours truly is going to be speaking for a while. And Skander Larby, enterprise sales engineer lead at Google, put together some slides as well. So let's talk about products versus projects. We're going to talk about data products, thinking about data in terms of products instead of in terms of projects. Then we'll also talk about building apps via API. So let's dive right in. I'm going to share a little story about uh, when I was a, a young kid, I saw an advertisement, I was probably seven years old, for the money store. And I distinctly recall thinking to myself, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. You know, money is what you take to the store in order to buy products. So what on earth could the money store be doing? It made absolutely no sense to me. It was sort of an early conundrum, if you will, as I thought about what's going on in this world. Of course, I didn't know about mortgage loans back then and what that all meant. And so that's what we're talking about here is mortgage loans, right? So let's kind of dive into what that means. If you start thinking about financial products or financial instruments as we're often calling them these days, that kind of opens up the creativity about what you can do with these things, right? So let's talk about the stock market. In 1792, the Buttonwood Agreement was signed. 24 brokers got together under a Buttonwood tree and put together this treatise, basically, which became the foundation for the stock exchange. Well, that's when you could start trading commodities. And of course, eventually we traded securities. And then it got even much more sophisticated over the years to where you could trade derivatives, you could trade options, you can sell companies short, for example. That's a very tricky thing to do. And it's also pretty dangerous to sell something short. Uh, you can really get burned if, uh, if the stock goes in the wrong direction. And that's exactly what happened just recently. Remember this guy, his name is Keith Gill. You should look up the YouTube video of this one when GameStop closed up to 65, up 1,500% from July of 2020. So this guy made millions of dollars. Well, what did he do? What they did was very clever. They used social media and on Reddit and on YouTube, of course, but on Reddit, he drove up all this excitement and anticipation around GameStop, which of course is just a, a brick and mortar store that sells gaming equipment. And a lot of the hedge funds had been bidding against GameStop, which uh, you know is fairly cynical position to take, but they were basically betting on GameStop just dying and going away, in which case the hedge funds would clean up. Well, a funny thing happened on the way to the Wall Street uh, market that day, GameStop spiked. What happened then is they forced all these hedge funds to cover their positions. So suddenly you had Robinhood, which of course was supposed to, uh, <laughs> the, the name would indicate robs from the rich and gives to the poor, right? Well, Robinhood had to go out and borrow billions of dollars. These hedge funds just took it in the gut because of these creative product-oriented traders. They were thinking in terms of interesting financial products. They drove all this excitement into GameStop. The price skyrocketed, forced these hedge funds to dump billions of dollars into the markets, right, of liquidity. The reason I'm giving this example is really to point out that folks, you out there, out there, the data product designers, this can be you. Basically, you can define and design data products that can really fundamentally change how your business operates, how your, how your life operates, the opportunities that you create. It's really interesting what you can do if you open your mind to what a product is versus a project. And of course, using APIs. We'll talk about that in a second. And just today, I looked up whatever happened to GameStop. After this, it went down significantly, down to like 40, I think. But where did it go from there? Today, it's at 219. Can you imagine? This guy says he's always wanted to, uh, to build a big arena in his home neighborhood, so now he can probably do that. Uh, but of course, you will get hit sooner or later with, uh, with lawsuits. So he's being sued right now. I think they're going to have a hard time prosecuting that suit. But let's think about this for a second. Products versus projects. It's the same thing. At the end of the day, we're going to create a product, but we used to call it a project, but they're very different in terms of your perspective and how you think about these things. A product ideally will last a very long time. A project ideally should finish very quickly, right? You want to be effective. You want to do it right, but you want to do it very fast. So it's complete opposite. One should last as long as possible. The other should be as short as possible. Think about profit centers. A product is often viewed as a profit center. It's something that generates revenue generates profit, improves the bottom line, improves the top line of the business. 
a project is viewed as a cost center. We have to pay people to do stuff, right? So that's the old world view of information projects. Designed for many users is what a product is supposed to be, but it's supposed to be built by only a few users. So again, these are all polar opposites and it's typically tangible, whereas a project is pretty amorphous. You set a number of people, you have tasks, you have sprints, for example, in the software development world that you're focused on. But the point is, it's really hard to get very concrete about exactly how long a project is gonna take. You can try, but you have to understand that you're gonna run into things you did not expect. So let's pivot a little bit to talk about APIs. What are these things? APIs have been around forever. That's a univac in like the 1970s where you would have, what was it called? An application programmer interface, right? So this is not new. It's been around from the earliest days of programming and of software development, of course, of the data industry. And on the right-hand side there, you see Roy Fielding speaking to OSCON. So who is that guy? Roy Fielding wrote the paper on REST, representational state transfer. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but look here, it was introduced in 2000 by Roy Fielding. His dissertation explained the REST principles that were known as the HTTP object model in 94. So the term is intended to evoke an image of how a well-designed web application behaves. It's a network of web resources where the user progresses through the application by selecting resource identifiers, such as this example, this example and resource operations like get or post, resulting in the next resources representation, the next application state being transferred to the end user for their use, right? That's rest. I'm old enough to remember when SOAP was supposed to be the standard, simple object access protocol. I wonder if Scander remembers that, but SOAP went away because REST turned out to be so much more powerful, so much more dynamic. It is now the de facto standard in the world of application interfaces today. So with that, let me queue up Scander's slides and go full screen. And Scander is out there waiting to talk about this stuff. So let me just dig back a little bit. Good, Scander Larby had a solution. So Scander, take it away, just say next when you wanna move your slide. Yeah, thank you, Eric, for having me today. And, and uh, you know, really fascinating. I, I, I was not born actually on, uh, on, the, on the IBM uh, uh, equipment uh, you presented, uh, but, uh, uh, but I work on mainframe uh, for, for the short story. So yeah, today I wanted to really to talk about the API landscape because obviously I come today as, as, you know, as you know, representing of Looker, but I, I just wanted to talk about you know, APIs and what you just talked about, really productizing uh, data. Uh, with APIs, so it's not. I know a lot of people here on the call are, are familiar with you know dashboards and all of that, but today we really want to focus about uh, the look at the API for data. So next. So before we dive into the the, the API, uh, I think right now, and especially because you know we talk about product, but we also want to talk product with data. And I think you you mentioned like actually it's so funny that you showed this iframe, uh, this mainframe. Because what's, what's very interesting is uh, the past world uh, was like, you know, database were, you know, on-premise, whereas right now all the databases are in the cloud. And what Looker does is really like, thanks to its powerful API, it's really bring the data from the cloud. So we really let all the data centers work and we're going to bring this data on the fly and transform it on the fly into those products. Next. Well, I think that's something you you and I you know discussed, right? I think it's uh, that you know Eric Schmidt was actually at Stanford um, doing a class, and he was interviewed by Red Hoffman. Uh, I mean, famous for I think founding uh, LinkedIn, and he basically said, "Well done, platform API are the key to everything." And that's what I I want to highlight in in my next slide is. Um, is that every day, every product that we see and that we use are basically using uh, APIs. So all our products, whether we order food, take the, uh, take the bus, pay something online, uh, book a flight ticket, uh, everything now is driven by APIs and actually all products. And I really like how you distinct the difference between product and project, how every product now are basically the intersection of, of some of those APIs that you can see here, like travel, SMS, shipping, everything now is, is driven by um, uh, a huge amount of, of APIs that are providing services. So SMS as a service, food delivery as a service, 
and that can be blended into new product uh, that you guys can create. Next. So now I think it's going to be a, a you guys bear with me. It's a, it's really we are in the heart of of, of Looker and and uh, and I hope uh, you guys know uh, SQL and databases. But really, what you see on the left, all those dots, this is really data. Like data is is collected by companies uh, uh, when you make a transaction, a purchases. So we really see on the left side, like you know, those huge amount of database. Whether you guys have Snowflake, BigQuery. MySQL, Postgres, um, uh, SQL Server, et cetera, Oracle databases. And what we've done is with Looker is we basically created a product where uh, developers can ask questions to the data without knowing SQL. So really the API, the RESTful API uh, from Looker will be able to go into the database, collect this data and turn this data into information and return data into JSON. So what Looker is, is really like an API plus a metadata layer that will be able to ask questions to, uh, uh, to the data. Next. So what it means, um, to, and really to be uh, very, very, uh, to make it very, very simple, it's like you have all those applications that we use every day uh, that we, it could be like, a, again, e-commerce, it could be, a, um, I think you talked about the stock market and Robinhood, for example. I really like, Eric, what you, you said about Robinhood, actually, they're one of our customers. Uh, when you go to Robinhood, you can see all those charts and all those charts are basically like, for example, GameStop uh, to see like the top, top 100 uh, stocks, the top five IPOs, all those products are data driven and they are very dynamic. Obviously, we saw that with either the crash or, or the, <laughs> the, how uh, the, the, the stock of, of GameStop is, is, uh, is, is soaring, but it's, it's, it's fascinating how all those applications are basically backed by data and all those products are actually fed uh, uh, using APIs. So those APIs, as you can see, they are like, especially with Looker, you have like four type of action, like the application is requesting the data in order to you know, see the real time uh, price of a, of, a, of, a, of a certain stock, check the permissions, making sure you guys have all the permissions, passing the filters, for example, passing the filters of the company, the database will return the data and render the data so the application can display it. So we really have this nice divide and conquer type of, you know, having those applications, those products that have front-end uh, design, and then we have products such as Looker that will take care of like manipulating the data, retrieving the data. Next. So why I think uh, when it comes to API, we, we can't talk about API without talking uh, by developers. I mean, developers are really the, the you know, the, the they are the magician, right? We provide them the, the technology, the, the programmatic interface uh, uh, and, and those REST API, but the developers, they wanna be free to also customize the experience for their end users. Uh, when you talk about product, Eric, uh, product nowadays, uh, they need to be, uh, they need to have a customer uh, interface that is pleasing and very easy to understand, as opposed to like complex business intelligence, complex dashboard. If you look at Robinhood, I think the success of Robinhood and other companies is how intuitive it is. So really using those APIs uh, allows developers to be very creative, innovative with the interface and bring the data uh, into really modern and, and creative interface that are for us consumers very easy to understand, but also very easy to take, take action on. So then when the stock is going crazy, we can easily take an action and buy or sell. I'm not giving any advice here. Um, yeah, and, and real quick, yeah. let me just chime in to comment on something. Yes. You, you talk about how auto-generated SQL for 50 plus databases, you know, I see this as a, as a trend a sort of macro trend in the industry there was a time not long ago we talked about this yesterday on the show as a matter of fact when the big vendors this is sap ibm oracle etc they all talked about standardization right and what did they mean by standardization they basically said look don't use all those other guys products just use our products they're tightly integrated they work together that's what you want that was the old model and what Looker did that was very clever is they said, look, that whole dynamic is changing now. And this format, this architecture understands that people are going to have all sorts of different databases that they like to use. There are all sorts of legacy products or, or tools in 
production right now that are going to be used and people want to use. And so the sort of mega trend is, is understanding and accepting heterogeneity and then building a layer of abstraction in which you can play around and then treat all those different systems as sources and or targets. So this I think is very clever because think about it, through APIs and through the web now, we have this integrated view of the world where we can grab information from anywhere, like Scanner was saying, whether it's whether it's market data or weather data or product data or whatever the case may be, you can connect via API. And I actually wanted to talk in my uh, brief intro earlier about the data ops movements. We'll talk about that maybe later on. But the idea is that you want to enable your users to grab data from wherever in whatever system, whatever kind of database is already being used and you play around with it in that abstraction layer and I think that's very clever. And it's your favorite stack, Angular, Node.js, whatever you want to use, you can use. And Looker enables that across the spectrum. Is that right, Skander? That's exactly that. I mean, we we really, you know, think of us, we are really what the data as a service, right? Like, you know, like you have the API to be taking care of SMS. And to your point, Eric, it's, it's exactly that. You have data from Snowflake, from Redshift. You want to build an app. You don't care about, I mean, especially now, you know, companies, how complex they are, you know, with all those merge and acquisition, you know, every company is now have different landscape of databases, you know, it's, so what, that's exactly our approach. It's like, we really want to give a platform, completely abstract the data layer and provide it as a service and yeah, put it in any stack that you want uh, and go for it and look up basically auto-generate all the SQL without human errors. Really one of our goal was really for us to eliminate human errors. I don't know how, if you proficient, Eric, you are in, in SQL, I'm sure you, you are excellent, but you know, like managing time zones, access, permissions, filtering, all of that was really cumbersome. I personally spent so much time writing SQL um, and, and it, it's true, human errors are always there. So that's really what Luca is also helping our developers to, to, to cover. Yeah, and just a, a quick aside, since we talked about financial services, and um, we're talking about auto generation of the SQL, right? So there's an optimizer that's gonna do that for you. So you won't make mistakes, right? It's not gonna make a mistake. In the financial services world, if you want to upgrade some system, there are regulations that say, you're not even allowed to touch that code with your bare hands. So you can only make changes to code using other technologies. And it's for the exact reason that Scanner just mentioned, people make mistakes. And, uh, we have, and even though there are these certainly rock star SQL experts out there who can crank out code tighter and faster maybe than some of these query engines can do, nonetheless, people make mistakes. And if you make a mistake in a SQL query, it can be hard to find and hard to understand. It might be too late. But anyway, Scanner, back to you. No, and, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you talk about that. And, you know, every product also, when, when we talk about mistake, everything can happen. And that's why we... And again, it's not really to talk about all the features of Looker, but we made it so it's version control. So it's very important for us to have, uh, and we're probably the only product on the market that actually have, a pro uh, that have an approach that is software development lifecycle. Instead of thinking of business intelligence, remember when we were building dashboards over and over and save the dashboard, share it. Our approach is really to version control. Like if I define the gross margin or the EBITDA of a company, or oh, you know the, the 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 number the volume of, of of shares exchanged per day, all those data definition we wanted to uh, define it in one single place that is a semantic layer that is version controlled. So then if I change something on how I define it, it propagates down to hundreds of my applications. So I don't need basically to review oh application one two three I need to change how I calculate my EBITDA. So that's something we. We really thought through, which is really about the centralization, but also versioning and, and iterating uh, on the product. Uh, I think we can go uh, next. There we go. And, and I just wanted, uh, uh, Eric, to give uh, to your audience some, some colors, because you know, every time we have those abstract, uh, uh, you know, architecture diagram, I just wanted also to provide to, uh, uh, to the audience, like really some colors around it. And what do we mean by building uh, modern data analytics product or modern data product. It's really products that need, that have low entry uh, uh, barrier when it comes to understanding um, uh, the interface. It doesn't necessarily look like a dashboard. You see here you have, uh, we use many technologies. We use Looker, we use Google Maps, but we also use other technology that are not part of Google. We use, for example, Twilio to send text messages. 
uh, we're using some framework about artificial intelligence and machine learning. So my point here, uh, Eric, is in order to productize such a product, such an interface, the beauty is that we can use the right API that does the right job. And for example, the Google Maps, uh, it needs data. And we're feeding this data from the Looker API. And uh, if you hit next, and you'll see here, when you drill down on, on this application that is basically a fleet management for, uh, for truck drivers, uh, um, we, we basically can um, uh, drill down and really create also interface, again, that don't look like anything uh, you probably have seen in the business intelligence world. I've seen some comments about the Tableau and, and there's so many great products out there, Power BI and all those business in, in intelligence tools. What we try to, I mean, what we are achieving with Looker is going beyond business intelligence, is from dashboard and reporting, taking it to modern interactive application. Next. And so you see here, uh, Eric, that's the big change. And when we, when we work with our customers now, when we think of the API, they, don't, they are not like, you know, locked into this, you know, line chart and pie chart. Uh, you know, tree map type of mindset, they are really trying to humanize information. And that's a big shift that we see. Uh, it's really like trying to, I mean, using data, but having a, a visual representation that speaks to the audience. Not everyone is a data engineer, business intelligence person, but me personally, even without training, I can see that there's something about a truck and a driver on this application. So how we democratize information, everybody talks about that. Like, you know, everyone that you said, you know, like all those vendors and I'm not going to name them because we, we probably ourselves say that sometimes like, you know, you need to democratize data. But thanks to developers and innovative companies uh, taking APIs to the next level, they are building the next generation of application that are, you know, humanizing and actually democratizing information. I'm going to pause here, Eric, because uh, I... I, I, I don't know your, if you have any comments on that or any questions. Well, no, I'll tell you what I really like about this. And, and we're talking about the next generation of applications. Think about how much application development has changed now. We have more developers in the world than ever before. I looked it up the other day. It's in the tens of millions of developers. And what's cool here is that the data is really the substrate. The data is the fuel that gets pumped into these views of the world. And it can be dynamic. So in the old days, it was very it was very static. And what we want these days is a very dynamic environment. Just think about how software used to be developed. You used to have to download it or get your CD-ROM and load it in and into your operating system and all this crazy stuff that has all basically gone out the window now. So in terms of designing your applications, Scanner makes an excellent point. The UI is so critically important. Now, granted, it's just a lens through which you're looking at different data points, but the simpler and the more direct that UI can be, the more use you're going to get too. And, and that's something you can track these days, right, Scanner? So the nice thing about this new generation of apps of dynamic API-driven applications is that you can track all that stuff, who's using it, which buttons are they click on, which buttons are they not clicking on. All of this goes into the sort of software development lifecycle that Scanner talked about, right, Scanner? Absolutely. I mean, we. I mean, at Google, I can speak of one of the products that we have at Google Cloud, which is called APG, but even Looker uh, uh, internally, but even developers. I, I always say, you know, we have great technology, but some developers are actually having some event tracker, as you mentioned. So you can really start, you know, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, crawl and walk and, and have your own tracking system or leverage, you know, the one that offer Looker or even go enterprise grade with APG uh, that will monitor exactly what you said. It's like, it's literally like you had someone on the shoulder of each of the consumer and understanding like, oh, he clicked on it. Of course, not in a creepy way because we, we respect the privacy. Uh, I, I think you should know that all the product that we develop at Looker and Google, you know, have, you know, very serious standards standards you know about the privacy of people so we obviously you know love talking about those topics uh, maybe in another in another chat Eric but the, absolutely. there you go well and another point here is think about reusability 
and not reinventing the wheel. So again, if you think about your source of truth as the code that's used to, to create the pipeline that goes into the product at the end of the day, if you think in those terms and you recognize that you don't want to reinvent all these wheels, that's what we did for years and years was constantly reinventing this wheel, that wheel, when you can grab by API, you can let the heavy lifting be done by your partners so you can focus on your specific business application. And that's what's going to separate you from your competition because you're not out there trying to create all these other component parts, right, Scanter? I mean, you're absolutely right. Like the go to market, the speed, the agility on which you're going to develop those applications. Like you would be amazed, Eric, by the, the line of code behind this application. It's literally like to get data, like just to return data, it's probably one line of code. And the, the one line of code will return the entire data that feeds into this application. So the rest of the code is, is more like your UI, UX, you know, your different div and your CSS. So to, you, you actually on point, it's reducing. The, the, the amount of work, but also being completely reusable. And also when you call those, those, um, those API function, let's say run data, return data, the amount of work that is done behind the scene is you know, mind blowing. You know, it goes to those data centers, leveraging the computation power of like, you know, those crazy processors, you know, can also run some you know, artificial intelligence model. So the power that we provide to developers now is, is literally like you know, mind blowing. Literally, like one line of code, what's happening the behind the scene when it passes into Looker and goes into those data centers is, is just, you know, revolutionary. And I foresee that to be, uh, uh, to be continuously uh, uh, increasing in terms of horsepower, calculation, and predictive analytics modeling. Yeah, and that's, that's the other point too, right? Is that you're, you can dynamically benefit from all the innovations that are occurring under the hood. You don't have to track all that stuff yourself. You don't have to build any of that stuff yourself. You're just building the connections to the APIs that allow you to pull the data in. And what happens beneath or behind those APIs is up to the partner that's innovating on your behalf and on behalf of all of their clients, right? That's 100% correct. And, you know, like we have, a, you know, you talked about product. Today, product, they are like geographic, you know, like you, you have, you, a lot of companies are trying to type into market. Like, let's say they want to be in Japan, they want to be deployed in Singapore, in Germany. So you have all your different, you know, web analytical product. And nowadays, calling the API, as you just said, just to give you an example, the API will route correctly the, the geographic zone, you know, ask the data where the data is is going to be you know localized so if your data is in germany the api will take care of routing everything you know from your consumer to to get access to the data that is correctly geographically uh, assigned and return the data that belongs to this user so we without any effort whatsoever for the developers to write the sql query trying to create like a load you know geographic load balancing system etc cetera, etc cetera. so that was just a mini example but i hope it resonates to your audience because I personally wouldn't be able to do it on Monday morning, creating a, a geographic load balancer. <laughs> right. Well, and also the other side of the equation here is we kind of hinted at some of the regulations out there and Scanner is referring to GDPR and CCPA and some of these new regulatory waves that are just crashing across the industry. And if you take the proper approach, what you're doing is you're building in the guardrails, right? So data ops is the version of DevOps that focuses on data. And if you, if you nail down your DevOps and you nail down your data ops, then you're not even gonna create a, pop, a possibility for one of your users breaking a rule or breaking a regulation. So it's not just the errors in hacking out SQL code, for example, it's errors that could result in significant fines from some of these regulatory agencies. So again, by really focusing your magic on the data pipeline that you're building, on the product that you're creating, you number one, build in the guardrails from a DevOps perspective, but number two, build in the guardrails from a data ops perspective too. So you're protecting the user, you're protecting the, the, the world at large, basically, but you're also protecting yourself from mistakes that could be extremely costly. So Scanner, take it away. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you, you said it better than, uh, than myself. And actually, I wanted to transition maybe on the, on the, on, on the you know, showing, uh, showing to some of the, um, uh, you know, other interface and really giving uh, uh, everything that we said around the, the security consideration. And it's really about true about protecting yourself, also protecting your employees. A lot of application that you build can be uh, designed for your for employees or for the for clients. And, and really, I just wanted to put some 
some colors around what you can do with, um, for example, here, the Google Map API, the Looker API. Uh, it's about like thinking of a world of now, um, you know, a lot of people think of, you know, in terms of, I mean, every product are multi-dimensional. It could be like, you know, financial data, it could be weather data. It's about, you know, uh, geolocalization data. And really what I wanted to, to talk to you today, uh, Eric, on top of, um, of, of the API is really, how can you create those products that are multidimensional? And really the API is the key for that uh, 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 in order to bring those kind of application into life in no time. Because of course, you talked about projects and those projects, remember those big, lengthy data warehouse, business intelligence project that actually never end, right? You, you're done with the data warehouse, you try to answer the question and the person are like, oh, but we don't need this report anymore. We don't need the quarterly data. And the data was always wrong and then you have to do it again. And sometimes we were even changing the product and the technology in between, if we were not changing the whole management, you know, because they've never provided a question. So we really think of API as a, new, a way of being more agile when it comes to build those type of product. Uh, next. Uh, this is more around the predictive analytics. So I think, uh, we, we already talked about that. It's about like, you know, leveraging computation power, but also artificial intelligence model. And I know it sounds very buzzy, but you know, uh, Eric, one of the artificial intelligence type of thing that I really like, it's like, for example, you know, like those, you know, you upload a photo uh, and then you have now APIs that basically says, oh, it's a dog or it's a plant. Like I myself at home have, you know, plants that I don't know the name or I don't know how to pronounce the name, plus being French, imagine in the world I'm living in, but, um, and now you have, you can build an application that basically you take a photo and you have, for example, a Google API called Visual AI. It will tell you what's the plant, uh, what's the plant name, all the information, all this information can be stored in a database. So anybody can now within, you know, with few development experience, build an application that would recognize objects or anything, put it in the data and maybe do some analysis about it or selling those plants. I mean, not, nobody wants to sell my plants, but uh, I, hope, I hope it illustrates, you know, the power now of really having some services that are behind those APIs in order to fuel your application with advanced ca capabilities that used to require a large team. You had to hire like so many data scientists, data engineers, so imagine now, like all, all the things, yeah, like a one-man show now can basically access maybe 10, 10 to 20 different type of, of jobs and very advanced capabilities. Yeah, and I'm glad you, this is a great example. So real quick, I'm going to throw in a, a story of what Scanner is talking about. I had a guy from General Motors on DM Radio probably five years ago, and they were talking all about manuals. So just again, to the power of APIs, folks, think about this, this uh, new API that Scanner is talking about for visual identification of products. Think about the, how that revolutionizes your, uh, your car manual. Right in the old days, you had to take out this physical manual and okay, go to the index. I need to fix something, some part about the oil. Where, how can I change the oil? You go to the index, you find it. Or for more complicated parts, you know, you, you're like trying to figure out what is this part? Do you even know what this thing is? Well, now with these APIs, you can point your camera at the object. And this is what the guy was telling me from General Motors. He said they're working on being able to identify that part and then ascertain what you're probably trying to work on and give you the instructions right there or point you right to a YouTube video. So again, the power is in the API. You're accessing functionality from a different service, from a different location, a different domain, a different company, and weaving that into the power of your own application. You don't have to build all that stuff yourself. You're just reaching into these different environments. And frankly, folks, to me, this is really part and parcel to what I'm calling the fourth great generation of, of enterprise technology and enterprise computing. First, you had the mainframe. We talked about that. Then you had client server. Then you had the early days of ASP, as we call it, application service providers. And now you have software as a service. Well, if you think about the engines of Google Cloud Platform, of Amazon Web Services, of Microsoft Azure, the next generation is what we're talking about right here, where you build your interface, your data product is reaching by API into these different systems, whether it's for weather, whether it's for price of gold, whether it's for the price of Bitcoin, whether it's for 
products that are moving coming into a particular domain by RFID tags. So the point is that th you have to kind of open your mind about what's possible these days. And if you really stay focused on the specific product and the functionality that your users need and stay abreast of what is available by API, because that stack of functionality is growing by the day, right, Skander? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think you, you said it, uh, you, um... Um, you, you said it perfectly, uh, uh, Eric. <laughs> I can't add anything more to that. You, you... <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, we can go next. And and I'm glad I, I I'm glad actually we, we transitioned to this slide because I think there were actually questions in the audience uh, uh, about you know um, how the Looker API can be more useful. So I wanted actually to dive into the engine of, of, um, of an application. You know, we, we've seen those applications with the human interface. So I wanted Eric to present you how it would look like for the mind of a web developers, like how to look at the Looker API, where does it sit and what Looker API does. So every web application typically have a backend and a front end. The backend will take care of like user operation because all your pro all the product that you talked about, like the General Motors one that recognize the part in the engine, obviously you have users, right, that are going to be authenticated. So maybe you, you can have a, you know, uh, archive all the historical, you know, parts that you've taken, taken a photo of. And so you need like some kind of user permissioning. Uh, control of your data. So you have all the uh, users that are going to be managed by your backend. And what the backend is going to do is ask and get data from the Looker API. So basically, it's like returning the right data to the right person and, uh, that belongs to the right person and bringing all this information into the front end. And so I just wanted to show you here, like, uh, and it's really more as a reference, how do we see um, one of the best practice of, of, uh, of a modern data application by, uh, by just illustrating the different, the four big components like users, backend, uh, Luca API and frontend. So hopefully one, one image is worth a thousand words. Uh, next. Oh, yeah, and just real quick here, I just wanted to, sure. to talk about what we're creating again. Think about how this is reaching into all these different environments to create that static product, if you will, that you're looking at. That's the idea is that everything else happens behind the scenes. The end user doesn't care about how that gets done. The end user just wants to make sure that it's done. But what Skander is explaining with this fantastic slide here is that all of these component parts get brought together at runtime when it's needed to create that, uh, as you're calling it here, this SPA, this single page app, and then bam, there it is. It does what you want it to do, right? I mean, absolutely. And, uh, and also, again, because, I mean, Eric, I have to say the questions of, 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 of your audience is, is really on point. It not only takes care of all the rendering of the data, and somebody asked, you know, if it supports like row level, column level security. Exactly. That's exactly what Luca does here. It's like Luca takes care of everything about data. And you know data, everybody says always, they use one word for data, but data is very complex. Yes, role level, column level security. You know, also Eric, for especially if you like, and I, I feel like you, you're very savvy in, in finance and investment, you know, the formatting of, of this data, like how many decimals you want, the percentage, the different currencies, all of that is going to be managed by Looker. So really think of Looker as kind of like your data guru that will, through the API, return the data in the proper format. Managing the, 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 the row level security, the column level security, the permission, uh, but also the giving the access or not, but also the caching. You know, Eric, like all those products now that we, you know, we work on, we don't like waiting, you know, for the data to be on the screen. You know, we hate this loading and spinning. Right. <laughs> and, and, and so and so that's what really Luca does here. And uh, I, I'm glad you extended actually on, on, on this conversation. OK, good. Next slide. Yeah, so this is a uh, um, uh, this is again another uh, uh, another screen that I wanted to show you because uh, as much as I like you know going in the heart of an application, sometimes I like taking a step back and and really um, uh, you know saying like you know on the left side you have and you mentioned like you have all those Amazon BigQuery the SQL Server all those database and you talked about the blood of those applications. I think you or, or the I think you said the blood or I said it I don't know but really the blood of those applications is data. And I just wanted to show you here, Eric, is like when we think of application and you, you, you said, oh, we're entering the, fo the, the fourth wave. I agree with you. And the fourth wave for me is also cross devices. 
now applications like people are now you know on the mobile phone they're on the they're even on the watch you know like all those connected watch they're also on the large screen you know like you know when you go on those buildings don't you like you know seeing those massive screen that has like kpis you know that gives you like op op you know, operation like even like i would love now going on buildings and see like how um, the air quality is in the building, like all those KPIs now, all this information that we need to have in real time, because it's better for our life. And we love, we, we, when I say we, we, we and uh, the developers and the companies we work with, they, they always come, come to me and say, hey, we don't want this desktop product anymore. I mean, oh, we have it, but it doesn't make any sense. They say, our audience, there are people who are on the field, people, you know, uh, if, if you're a truck driver, you don't have a laptop. I mean, you have a laptop, but you're not having a laptop while you drive. You need the information in real time in a connected device. And we see more the rise of cross devices application fueled uh, uh, with the Looker uh, platform and, and its API. Next. So, uh, because I think Eric, in in, a, in today's topic, you know, you we 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 talked about two things. I mean, of course, we talked about product, uh, but all I mean, and and you know, having more consumer application, but also we talked uh, because we talk about product and you have an asset. We also want to talk, I think, about monetization because uh, really, when you when you have those products, we both we we need to think about the value that we bring to those consumers, but also for your organization. So, unlocking customer. Uh, a value typically leads to unlocking revenue. Uh, it's going to be product that you can monetize. There are a lot of companies nowadays that are solely monetizing uh, data, and and uh, uh, and this is really a big opportunity for everyone. Next. So I just wanted to show you some application and some clients, uh, um, you know, that, that worked with us and built those applications. So GoSpot Chat, GoSpot Check. So it's kind of like a General Motors uh, example that you mentioned, Eric. You know, like uh, like they they taking photo of um, uh, of parts. Except go spot check, they take photos. Like you have operators, they go at the supermarket, and you can see here they take a photo of a of a of a beverage, and the beverage it returns all the information about the beverage. They store the price. So then you have operators, they can go you know to Whole Food, uh, to Safeway, to all those stores, and basically do like a comparison pricing. Uh, very quickly, and that's what GoSpot Check offer. And imagine the scale of the uh, uh, the use cases you can imagine of like you know scanning those those uh, those items, bringing data, and they created an offer that is priced. Uh, so it gives for companies the ability to uh, to hire people to operate and analyze the price of their items. And you can imagine the landscape of of things you can do: benchmark analytics, uh, benchmark analytics, pricing comparison. Uh, even pricing tools, like how should I price better my tool in order to sell more in this particular supermarket? So really, we are entering a new world of, of you know, uh, from data to product and monetizing this product. Yeah, and that's another really good example to, to kind of give some inspiration to our audience here. If you think about how sophisticated the competition is getting in just about any space. So we talked about trucking, we're talking about retail products, consumer products here, if you're not leveraging the power of APIs, someone is passing you right now because your margins are gonna go away. And what we're seeing now is uh, in, there are all sorts of ways that this um, can get manifested in the real world. But what Scanner is pointing out is that there are companies that are sharpening their pencils and figuring out exactly how much to charge for, for garden variety products, Anheuser-Busch, Twisted Tea, whatever the case may be, if you're not leveraging the power of these APIs and building apps for your buyers, for your purchasers, for the people who are delivering these products, someone's going to pass you up and it's happening very, very quickly. But here, I'll go to the next slide. No, thank you, uh, uh, Eric. And yeah, that's another example, Wix. So that's basically, uh, um, you know, how, how to monetize basically data at scale. And the Wix is basically, you know, uh, uh, a platform to build a website. It's like a no-code uh, platform to create website, and they wanted to offer uh, sales analytics within their application and also visitor analytics. So they wanted to have two new SKUs uh, for their product, and they didn't want to build it from scratch. Even if they had all the developers in the world, they didn't want to build like a whole data analytics platform. So when they come to Looker, they say, "Well, we want to create this new offering to our 
uh, customers at scale. So over 100 million users are connecting to it. And if you want to scale, maintain a whole in-house analytics product, so they delegate it to Looker and embed it into uh, their solution. So that was just an, another example of, of how can you add value to an existing product? In this particular example, Wix is you know, a tool and they focus on their business, which is helping their customers building websites and deploying them uh, at, at ease, and how they can uh, uh, add some, uh, some value uh, and going to market very quickly, like taking a couple of months to add another uh, analytic solution within their product. So fantastic example here. Uh, that shows not only the product, but also the scale. Uh, you can see some uh, some numbers here on the left. Yeah, and this this is another interesting thing to dive into quickly, folks. Think about providing data to your customers, right? You kind of see this in the marketing world where in your email marketing program, it'll say your average open rate is 11%. The industry average is 10%, for example. So you can know that you're staying on top of what your competition does, and that's going to get ever more granular. So you talk about how Wix has 80 distinct user personas, whether it's a yoga studio, e-commerce, any number of things. What, what you'll learn over time is that we'll get more and more sophisticated about knowing what is the acceptable average business for a, a size of a company, for a yoga studio of a thousand square feet, for example, we're moving closer and closer to really understanding. And, and let's face it, we, we know this from years of experience, what gets managed or what gets measured gets managed, right? And what's cool is if you have these KPIs, you can't have too many of them. You don't want to confuse the user, but if you boil it down to the key performance indicators that matter to your business and you monitor those, you'll be so impressed and amazed at how well people focus on that because they're going to try to get it. They're going to try to hit that mark. They're going to try to hit that number, right? So it's a motivational factor. It puts constraints and boundaries around what is otherwise tremendously amorphous, right? So the point is, as you share data with your customers, with your, with your partners, you're able to get more and more clear views of what is normal, what is abnormal. That's good for business development. It's good for security. It's good for lots of different things. But again, it's all driven by data. It's all driven by the ability to see across systems and to leverage the power of APIs, right, Skander? Absolutely. I mean, you, you really say I mean, so elegantly, and it's really also about making your customers data driven. Like, as we you remember now, I mean, not even remember. It's like now every company is are they call it so called data driven. But how about your consumers? How about your suppliers? How about making them more to your point, Eric? How do you make them more engaged? How do you also retain them on your product? Like, you know, do they have something to check out to navigate on? So I really like also what you said about having fewer metrics. But having, I like calling them golden metrics. Like, are you sharing with them a credit score, uh, a certain rating? What is the conversation that you're going to have around those two or three metrics? How those metrics are improving the life of, of your consumers or even the revenue of your consumers? Uh, so, uh, totally uh, on par here, Eric. And I'll give uh, you one one last quick story. I know we only got about ten minutes left, but uh, Howard Dresner who is uh, the guy who coined the term business intelligence 25, 27 years ago. He's a Gartner at the time. He's now running his own Dresner Advisor Services. He once told me a story of the one metric as a bread company in South America somewhere that he did some work with. And they had one metric. And he asked me, what do you think that metric is? I was like, gosh, I don't know. And he said, it's bread left on the shelf at the end of the day. So that shows them, well, here is excess product, excess inventory, and then they reverse engineered everything from that particular metric. So just kind of speaking to the simplicity of getting it to the simplest version you can possibly have to understand your business. Here was a big multi-million dollar company that focused on one key performance indicator, and that was how many loaves of bread are left on the shelves at the end of the day. So that's that was a pretty, you can't get less than one. <laughs> that's about as, as distilled as you're going to get down to one key metric. You're probably going to want two, three, five, maybe more, but make sure they're the important ones. They're the ones that, as you suggest, Gander, spur conversation conversations, get the salespeople talking to the marketing people, get the business people talking to the salespeople. That's what you want is conversations around what makes your business special. That's what's going to take you to the next level, right, Skander? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, you talked earlier about, yeah. Uh, and this is another great example. Uh, uh, and, and I want to, I really want to actually take you hope in a very humble way to what we call the space value chain. I don't know if you've ever heard about the space value chain. I actually discovered 
did when I work with Spire. So they're basically building satellites. And just to make it short, they, they build satellite, launch those satellites, and they track you know, maritime uh, data. So they basically track, uh, sorry, they, really, they track tankers uh, and collect information with the latitude, longitude, and they're like, oh, this tanker, this boat is on this location. And you know, they collect all the data into a big database. And they wanted to offer to their customers a visual uh, platform. You can even move next so we can see maybe uh, the, the, uh, the product. So you basically see that they provided uh, and transformed this data from satellite into information by creating an immersive experience that removes all the complexity as you can imagine. We know where we talked earlier, like the satellite, the device, the data collection, the, how real time, how efficient it is. And they distill all this information with tons ton of engineering, research, and development into a data application that allows their customers to track boats, monitor harbors, and also optimize the route of the fleet in order to be more um, efficient, fuel efficient. So you talked about it, Eric, about this metric that is uh, going to make change the game. It's, for example, here, uh, gas efficiency. Imagine when you have a fleet of tankers how much fuel you can save, how much value you bring to your customers. And of course, Spire is monetizing this data product. And the beauty of it is they went to market within six weeks. So it took only for them by embedding those platform, it, it took only for them six weeks to be able to put a, a product in front of their customers. That's pretty impressive. And, uh, and you talked too about the specifics, the tangibles, right? Your tangible costs like gasoline. Again, if you alert your employees, your partners, your customers, your prospects, whatever, if you give them that information, they're going to start managing. You just will. If you see the target, you're going to start moving towards the target. It's, it's in human nature. So uh, go ahead. No, uh, you're absolutely right. And I, I, I don't want to make because I know in, I want to be conscious of everybody's time, but what we see in the different offer, because we talked about product, we talked about APIs, and, and uh, um, but I think when it comes to monetization strategies, and I just wanted to share with the audience, like some of, I mean, some data-driven uh, strategies. So we see a lot of evolution from all our customers telling us we start with an indirect monetization strategy, which is the proof of value, you know, their product, uh, uh, show some information that is vital, like kind of like the credit score. The next, the next type of offer, it's like, okay, I want to see the credit score, but I want to see the recommendation to, uh, to optimize my credit score because it's nice to tell me that I have a very bad credit score of 600, but what can I do to, to change it? And that's when we see uh, what we call a more direct monetization offer. It's like, hey, benefit from advice, real-time credit score, anti-fraud. So they, they start bundling some some offer and that's what we see as the next level and that's where we see not just your revenue growing but also your profit uh, as you expand your ethical offering and then the diamond offer is where you work with enterprise and you say yes i can through my api i can deliver data straight to your company uh, i can have a bi tool cloud bi tool embedded into my solution so you can not just look at the data but also explore data on your own because looker has a self-service exploration tool that allows asking questions to the data without knowing SQL, and ton of other services. So I really just try to highlight the three stages that we see typically uh, in a monetization, in an embedded analytics and embedded monetization strategy into your product, those three stages. So they are not, uh, um, um, it, it, it's more like a, a, an overview, So, uh, but this is what we observe on the market. And I've added some, uh, yeah, some example, you know, like you've seen, uh, Eric, all those, you know, those enterprise and SaaS products where you have different plans. And by having a comprehensive analytical offering, having all those KPIs that you talked about, I really like the Baker example, like having the ability to, yes, I provide you how many uh, bread loaf or baguette are, uh, are on the shelf. Then imagine I want to drill down and say how many baguettes are left on the shelf across you know, in France, in Brazil, and then I want to drill down per, per country, per, per store. As you're going to provide a more comprehensive offer in your analytics offering, that's where you're going to price to higher tiers. So you can you can go next and 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 just shows like how other companies. You can even go next because I know we don't have much time, but just I just wanted to show like the pattern of 
companies that are adding analytics to augment the value of their product and how vital it is for every company is now to have an ethical offering, but that also can expand to a more enterprise grade uh, analytics offering. Yeah, this is fantastic stuff. And again, you're, you're showing the value of sharing that insight, sharing those analytics with your users. And again, what does that do? It increases engagement. And I like the way you talked about changing behavior because that's what you want. You want to change the behavior, you want to optimize the behavior of your employees, of your partners, uh, of your channel partners, whoever, to get them more focused on doing what is best for them and for you. And that's the key here, right? Is that app becomes the lens through which you're viewing this particular world. And again, if you focus on leveraging the power of these APIs, if you focus on your corporate DNA and bake that into these data products, that you can then monitor over time to see who's using what, what is the end result. And that gets us back to this whole thing of ROI, right? Return on investment. And let's face it, that's been very, as they say, loosey goosey over the years, but we're getting closer and closer to being able to identify, look, when we deployed this app, within two weeks, we saw that our gas usage went down 10%, that saved us $50,000. We also saw that the drivers got there in a more timely fashion. You can track all of these things. And because the cloud has all this metadata baked into it, it's dynamically designed to capture that information and allow you to reuse it. So you go back into your data pipeline, you figure out what tweak to make there, and then you project that back onto the screen into the data product, that single that the single page app as you describe it. But the point is it all revolves around optimizing workflow, optimizing the business that all relies on data, which increasingly is gonna be pulled by API, right Skander? Absolutely. I mean, you, you, you said it so well, Eric. It, it's really this shift of like all those insights we used to have internally, like BI, data engineer, we used to have internally. It's like putting it in a product and putting it in, a, in, a, in the hands of, of the people that actually need it. You know, it's no more like no longer the dashboard of like, oh, yeah, I know if I could do X and Y, I can optimize this. It's like, no, those insights now think of product first, put it in the hands of your consumers, your employees and change the game and also present them uh, substantial results and optimization improvement. So uh, really not much to add to what you said, Eric. It's, uh, it's uh, you, you, you right on the, you right on the money. Well, and this is very exciting folks. So I've said this before about Looker, these folks had the right idea, Lloyd Tab had the right idea years ago to recognize that the legacy environments are going to remain for an indefinite period of time. <clears throat> and you don't wanna to try to force someone out of the products that they're using. What you want is that layer of abstraction in which you can enable the free play, enable the creativity of your business analysts, of your, of your data product designers. That's what we are. We're product designers, right? And you want those products to be alive. And I can promise you, then you have product managers, right? Instead of a project manager, you have a product manager. And what happens? Anytime you build something, you take pride in what you've built. And so if you build this product, I can promise you the product manager is going to take pride in watching that product get used and watching the efficiency rise. All those things sort of follow on naturally. And, uh, and I'll just kind of close with this comment. Uh, we need to respect human nature and what gets people excited, what gets people upset, what, what inhibits productivity, what fosters productivity. And if you focus on building these products, ideally using as much data from APIs as you can, there are some hiccups here and there. You have to watch out for you know, hitting limits on API calls and things of that nature. But the point is, understand that people like to take pride in their work. And so if you focus on products instead of projects, you're going to be focused on profit centers instead of cost centers. And that's just going to send the business in the right direction. Closing comments from you, Skander. No, I, first of all, thank you so much for, for, for having us on, on, this, on this topic. I really like what you said about, um, about you know, focusing on product. The only thing also I can, uh, I can advise is don't, I mean, don't be afraid of failing, putting a project, like a product, sorry, in the hands of your consumers. We learn so much about failures and also the beauty of having a product that has so many, so much capabilities, such as Looker, is the ability to iterate. I've seen so many times on the market, uh, like innovative product that were not initially designated to generate revenue and that became actually the best seller of some companies. So I don't want to talk about pivoting 
or transform, uh, transformation, but I'm talking about evolution. People who innovate helps their company evolving. And that's why, that's why Lloyd and, and all our companies focused on is providing the tools to innovate and help your companies evolving. Exactly right. Well, folks, we do archive all these webinars for later viewing. Thank you so much for all these great questions. I'll be sure to pass them on for next time and send me an email if you want to be on one of these shows, info at insideanalysis.com. We always want to know what you want to know. Thank you so much, Skander, for your time and attention. Thanks all of you out there for your great questions. We'll talk to you next time, folks. You've been listening to The Briefing Room. Take care. <laughs>